Okay, I get to introduce to you my friend Tom Landis. Would you welcome Tom, y'all? Morning, Tom, again. I've known Tom for about 20 years. We've eaten together, we've laughed together, we've cried together. Tom's been mad at me before for messing around in his business. Um, I'll tell you later about that, Tom. Uh, but Tom's divine platform, and when we say that, we're talking about how God has shaped us and where God has placed us to be a blessing to the world, to have conversations about Jesus. Tom's divine platform is in the food service industry and most recently working with people with special needs. So Tom, tell us about it. Thank you. Pastor Neal's whiteboard exercise a couple weeks ago on what the world values encapsulated a wrestling match I've had with God ever since I made my first buck. And I've often wondered about those fishermen fruitlessly and frustratingly working all night I wonder if they had similar arguments before Jesus told them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. On Sunday mornings in church, in Bible studies, in seminary, when my kids are baptized right there, I see the proof that Jesus is king, and more importantly, I feel his grace. But maybe like you, I work and live out there in the real world, where it sure does seem like cash is king. I've been my own boss since October 31st, 1993, and in the 14 different restaurants, businesses, franchises I run, when I go in on the radio, I often hear the boss sing, all men want to be rich, rich men want to be kings, and a king ain't satisfied until he rules everything. Amen. Well, about a decade ago, God nudged me to test, to take and test my faith in the most sacred of sacred places, my place of business. Not where the streets have no name, not where the sidewalk ends, but where the buck stops. God nudged me through legendary football coach Gene Stallings, who wrote a book about his son, Johnny, who was born June 12, 1962, with Down syndrome. Coach's transparency and honesty led me to open a restaurant that would be employed by people with special needs. In honor of Coach's Aggie alma mater, we named it Howdy. But back to that story about the fishermen working all night, from which the spirit guided this mission for the meek. I looked at my industry, the restaurant industry, through the lens of the fishermen, broken in its labor turnover, impossible to find good help is what everyone says. But what if, like the fishermen, we, look, we listen to Jesus and cast our nets on the other side of the boat? On the one side, the current labor market, proven difficult at best, 180% turnover rate is not uncommon. On the other side, 240,000 special fish, 240,000 meek fish, 240,000 adults in Dallas alone that desperately pray for what you and I take for granted, and that's a job. For those with Down syndrome, a job. For the one in 39 Texans now born on the autism spectrum, a job. For the one in 21 kids struggling in school today with a learning difference, a job. My family went all in financially because in 2015, nobody would invest in a for-profit business run by people with special needs. Nine years later, We've created 165 sustainable jobs for people with special needs. We just signed our seventh franchise in Kansas City, and we're now in more than 1,500 Albertsons, Tom Thumbs, Randall's, Publix, and HEB grocery stores. <clears throat> now, 
maybe, maybe I've taught my employees to work. They've taught me life, grace, faith. They have easy to start conversations with Jesus all the time because their faith and their conversations are not tainted by agendas or self-consciousness. I see on a daily basis they share their love and their faith as quickly and easily as far too many of us tend to share our judgments and opinions. It's what makes them awesome employees. I did not know requiring God requires so much sacrifice. I didn't really know I had an issue with pride until I went from being a, a humble recipient of business awards to being a recipient of this church's emergency Christmas funds. We all know there's no guarantees in life or business, but of this I am certain. This life, a blip on history's timeline, is the only time in all of eternity where we can go all in and test our faith. Go all in. On behalf of the 62 and one meek Americans with special needs, thank you, Northwest Bible. Thank you, Tom. I'm telling you, Tom's crazy faith, his passion, as you got a little glimpse of it there, um, his willingness to risk for Jesus has been such an inspiration for me. And I want to invite all of us to stand for one more moment here. And, y'all, I really, this Sunday, when Tom said this idea of test our faith, really, we're going to look in particular, one beatitude as we go through this series, and today we're at Blessed are the Meek, for they all inherit the earth, and this is the one for me that tests our faith. And we're going to read all the beatitudes together again, and you'll notice on the slides here that instead of the word blessed, I have what I talked about week one, that God designed good life. Because everybody has their version of the good life, right? We all have it. Every politician, every political party, every group is putting out, you know, with, with passion, their desire, their idea of the good life. And what we said in this word bless is tied to some thoughts that come through all of Scripture that God has a version of what he calls the good life that is both fruitfulness and security that he wants for us. So let's read the Beatitudes this morning with that um, statement in there. Let's read together. The God-designed good life belongs to the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The God-designed good life belongs to those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The God-designed good life belongs to the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The God-designed good life belongs to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The God-designed good life belongs to the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The God-designed good life belongs to the pure in heart, for they will see God. The God-designed good life belongs to the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The God-designed good life belongs to those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The God-designed good life belongs to you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are the words of Jesus the King. Amen? Please be seated and turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. As we continue to look at these Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. And as you turn there, church, I, I want to remind you again that there's one thing that you need to be very, very clear on when you read the Gospel of Matthew his story of Jesus, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, when you read the Beatitudes, if you miss this, you actually miss the whole thing. 
Matthew is showing you that Jesus is the rightful king of the universe. And one day he's coming back and we're told that then that day every knee will bow. And tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yo, that's every knee and every tongue. No matter what they have thought about or believed on this earth, one day that's going to happen. And when he comes, what he's going to bring is going to be so good. God designed good life that the trees of the forest are going to clap their hands, that the universe is going to erupt in joy. And when we get to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, these are the values of Jesus. You could say it this way. This is the political platform of Jesus the King. And he is speaking to, frankly, the very surprising people that are part of his kingdom. And we've said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus came and he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what he was saying is you need to turn from all other values and you need to lock down your life as completely as you can on me. Tom referenced our, my whiteboard two weeks ago where I had you say what are the values of this world out there. And I want to remind you of six that you said on the screen here. We talked about things that the world values, competition and winners, power and money, influencers and beauty. And as we come to bless her, the meek here, it's why I love Tom coming and sharing his story that I've got to hear about the last 10 years about people with special needs. And so we're going to look at this, bless her, the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And I want you to know, Jesus' statements are notoriously difficult. And even meek seems to be a difficult word to really understand what was Jesus talking about there because there's so much background in the Old Testament about this. So we're going to dig deep on this word meek, and I'm going to say three things today, church. The first is this. It's an encouragement to the overlooked and the unimportant, that when Jesus says, he doesn't say, go make yourself meek and do a bunch of gymnastics to get to that point. He just says, when, when people have that kind of heart that we'll talk about, it's an encouragement to the overlooked and the unimportant. Also, I think to be fair to this, we need to talk about a warning to the powerful and the influencers. I'm talking about myself here and a lot of us in this room. And then lastly, um, a choice for us all. An encouragement, a warning, and a choice for us all, okay? So when we go to Matthew chapter five, verse five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I wanna talk about an encouragement to those who are overlooked, to those who, maybe this morning you feel unimportant. You need to understand when the, the person hearing that, the disciples, Jesus' first audience of the day, and all those who are overhearing, these are Jewish people, okay, that, that they understood that that word sounded like a concept, a word, uh, uh, some thoughts of some people that are often talked about in the Old Testament, and a lot of times in your English Bible, it's translated as the oppressed, the afflicted. Just to give you one example, in um, Psalm 76, it talks about God's judgment coming, and it says that when God's judgment comes, the earth is just going to stand still, and it says why God judgment is going to come. In verse 9, it says, when God arose to establish just judgment to save all of the humble, oppressed, afflicted, meek of the earth. All those are different words you're going to find in your different English Bibles that are this tied to this word meek in your New Testament. So here's what he's saying. When Jesus says, blessed are the meek, they're hearing, blessed are those who one, cannot save themselves, and blessed are those that really, when it comes to life's lottery, they've lost. They've lost it. <laughs> they have no chance, and their only chance, their only chance of being rescued is if God comes in and does something they cannot do for themselves. 
This is why this is so difficult, y'all, in a world where we're all thinking, what do I need to do to make things happen in my life? What do I need to do to make things happen in the world around me? And again, Jesus comes and says, listen, if this is your heart today, and you feel unimportant, forgotten, then just perhaps your heart is uniquely open to experience what I'm going to call the fairy tale ending that everybody wants. And the reason I say fairy tale ending is because of this promise Jesus makes. It's when he says they will inherit the earth. I want you to understand that when Jesus says that, he's actually talking about a very, very real issue of that day. You see, those Jewish people that were hearing Jesus speak that day, they were on their ancestral land, the land of their inheritance. But their ancestral land and the land of their inheritance was occupied territory at that time. It was occupied by the Romans. Oh, doesn't this sound so familiar? So it was occupied by the Romans at that time. And their land, the land that they had been promised was being bought and sold and traded by all these outsiders. And, 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 and Jesus comes in and says to those people who are basically at best day laborers in the land, he says, listen, one day you're going to inherit the land. You're, you're, you're going to have a fairy tale ending one day. And it's really hard to believe. And, and here's my encouragement for those who feel overlooked and unimportant. You need to understand that this particular verse, this particular beatitude, is actually almost a direct quotation from Psalm 37. Psalm 37, here's the encouragement. Psalm 37, it starts off and it, it, it says this. Listen, you need to rest in the Lord and you need to wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Don't worry because of the man who carries out his wicked schemes. It goes on in verse 8, and it says, cease from anger, forsake wrath. Don't fret. It leads only to evildoers. Now, just pause there for a second. Here's what he's saying. If this is where you are, this is hard, y'all. Re really, the psalmist is saying, listen, you're going to have to believe God for something here right now. That if you want to keep a heart that's really ready to experience more than you could ever ask or imagine, then you're going to have to fight the battle to not jump in and do what the world does. To get angry. To spend all your life worrying about what you don't have here. These, these are hard words. It says in verse 9, for evildoers cut, will cut, be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord... They're going to, there it is there, they're going to inherit the land. <sighs> Those who wait for the Lord, church, we believe there's power in his name, right? We believe, this is what they would have been hearing, Jesus saying, listen, there's a God in heaven who can break the unbreakable, the people who are occupying your land. We believe there's a God in heaven that can move the unmovable. And so in verse 10, it says, yet a little while and the wicked will be no more and you will look carefully for his place and he will not be there. And then you get verse 11 and here's the quote that Jesus actually quotes in that moment. But the meek will inherit the land and they will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. See, the land for those people at that time. You know, Tom mentioned about these people having a job. The land represented wealth. If you wanted to generate wealth at that time, you had to have the land. It was, it was like having a job. It was like having a place where you mattered in society. This is why I say, yo, this is like Jesus coming in and saying, you, you will get the fairy tale ending. And it's why Jesus could look at some folks who the, all the world would say, oh, we pity them. And Jesus says, oh, we don't pity them. Their hearts 
are uniquely in a place to be able to receive. And, and so here's what I want to say to you today. If there's some people out here right now who you feel unimportant and overlooked, you keep saying, okay, God, Psalm 37, I believe you for it. We, be we, we believe you to move the immovable, to break the unbreakable. God, I I'm believing you for, for what seems impossible. Now, I wanna give a warning to those with power and influence, which is a lot of us here. You know, when you read, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, I, I think there's another person, individual, that if you were a Jewish person at that time, you might have connected this beatitude to. It was one of their heroes in the Old Testament, a guy named Moses. You know, in, in, in your Old Testament, there's this book called Numbers where it says of Moses, we're told that Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. More than any person who was on the face of the earth. Moses, now, now before you think, yeah, I want to be like Moses, I, I want to just say a couple things about Moses' life. It's actually surprising that you would read this about Moses because first we know this, Moses was born and he lived in Pharaoh's household. He was powerful, influential. He fit with the competition and the winners and the beautiful, okay? And, and to say Moses at some point is the meekest man in the face of the, all the earth, I want you to know, that came through the crucible of a long process of God shaping him. Because Moses, if you know the story, you know there's this place in Moses' life as he's growing up. You, Moses sees an Egyptian beating on one of his people. And Moses, what rises up in him, frankly, is what Y'all, I'd like to add another thing to our list of competition and winners and beautiful and power and money. Y'all, I'm not, and hear me say this because somebody might ask me afterwards. I'm not saying anger is all bad, but I'm going to tell you I would put it up there as one of the values over our society that we put over love, okay? And, and Moses, being a man of his culture, when he saw that, he ends up killing that Egyptian, and he spends 40 years in the crucible of God, setting him aside in a desert as a shepherd, overlooked, unimportant, and, and nobody would have thought, oh, there's the beauty, there's the winner, there's, and that's, after 40 years, when God says, now Moses, I'm going to encourage you to come out of that, and you're gonna lead my people. And y'all, you know, I just say this warning because I really want for you to hear this this morning. First, if you're the senior pastor, oh, that's me. Um, if you're an elder here this morning, I see some of our elders. If you're teaching here or you're leading something, that Jesus says, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. And when he chooses Moses, it's only, only, At this point, 40 years. And, and to, to understand what that takes, I wanna dig in a little deeper to this word meek. It's a word that um, comes from this idea, the taming of a wild animal. I, I know we don't like these kind of pictures today, but the picture is this, a lion that has been tamed and humbled into submission and now is in a zoo and a little pretty girl takes the line around and tells them him what to do in front of all the people, right? That's the idea. 
The idea behind the word is this, that the wild animal finally comes to a place and says, I only run where you want me to run, how far you want me to run, and as fast as you want me to run. I I, I don't even eat until you bring me my food and tell me when it's okay to eat. That if I need saved, somebody else has to save me. Somebody else has to be God in my life. And guys, in a world of beauty and power and influence and anger and and me taking charge, because that's how things get done. And even some of you saying to Neil, to me right now, Neil, wait, but but somebody's got to take charge. You know, part of the reason we go there right now is because it's really hard to embrace this idea. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Y'all saw that story about the silverback gorilla at a zoo? This, this silverback gorilla grows, grows, grows up in a cage, lives his whole life in a cage. His whole life. And, and one day recently, a couple zoo workers, they thought he was in another room locked, and they go in his cage, and he's out. And they're freaking out. Now, they lived, okay, end of the story, they lived. But they knew, even though he, he lived his whole life in a cage, they knew how hard it was. They knew how hard it was to tame that thing in the gorilla. And you know what? I believe Jesus knows how hard it is to tame that thing in us. I mean, you talk about killers, human beings, And this, is, and this is part of the warning for those with power and influence. You think about Moses, y'all. There's a time when God's people are under his spiritual leadership and his leading them through the desert and they're thirsty and they're grumbling and they're upset and they're afraid and you know, what do we want during that time? We want a leader who says, this is what we're going to do. And God, I, I, as I read the whole story, I, I think this. God comes in and he says to Moses, Moses, listen, there's a rock over there. And you're just going to speak to the rock and water's going to come from it. And Moses, don't get in the way. Okay, Moses, we're going to make it really clear to people that they got to be in a position to say, God, we believe you for it. Whether it's food whether it's shelter, whether it's, you know, whatever this church is going to do, God, we believe you for it. And, and so we're told and that Moses comes and he comes before the rock. And I want you to see the story here in Numbers chapter 20. We're told Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And Moses says to the people, listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water out of the rock for you? Now, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't sound very meek at that point, does it? Uh, Okay, Uh, you know, Moses, I I think, is a little fed up and angry. And so we're told in verse 11 that Moses lifted up his hand. He's got a rod in his hand. And he (laughs) strikes the rock twice with his rod. And water comes forth abundantly. And the congregation and their beasts drank. And you know what? Uh, here, here's what I can imagine happened. Everybody's like, yes. Okay, now we got some leadership here. We got some force going here. We got people, when they get upset, they make it happen. Because, you, know, if, 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 you know, when we don't have that, here's what we wonder. Are people lazy? Don't they care? And, and, and I can imagine everybody that day is cheering, Yes! But there was one person that wasn't happy. Verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me. God, we believe you for it. As leaders, God, we believe you for leading and trying to figure out what did Jesus say when he said, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. God, we believe you for it, for leading, not simply just wholesale taking whatever the world says to, how, how to do it. God, we're going to believe you for it, not just getting mad when is, something isn't get done the way we want it done, done and taking our, taking our cookies and going home. God, we believe you for it. 
because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I've given them. Because really, you didn't, you didn't treat me as holy. You didn't put me out there as the one that they were going to have to believe in. Y'all, it's hard. This is really hard. And what I'm asking those of you, whether you lead a small group, whether you're on our staff, elders, whoever, Neil Tomba, I'm just asking us to say, <sighs> Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. God, somehow, I, I want to believe you for leading in a way that looks like wrestling deeply with your values and not the world's values. Okay? And y'all, man, if Moses who was the meekest man in all the earth. You know, God said to Moses, because of that incident, you don't get to go to the promised land. Moses didn't get to go to the inheritance. And if Moses doesn't get it, who can? Third point, a choice for us all. A choice for us all. You know, it's interesting, Jesus, you know, Jesus had no false humility, y'all. Jesus was constantly putting it in people's faces. I'm the bread of life. I, I am the living water. I, I am the good shepherd. I am before um, Abraham was born, I am. And when he was saying all those statements, let's be really, really clear. Jesus was saying, I am the one and only true God. There is no other God before me. There is salvation in no other name under heaven by which people must be saved. Jesus is really, really clear about this. And yet when it comes to these kind of personal quality, this is the one thing Jesus focused on. He said in Matthew later in chapter 11, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me, for I am gentle, I am meek and humble in heart, same word, and you'll find rest for my souls. And y'all, let me tell you what I was thinking about here. Wow. Wow. What does that mean for us, church, even as we lead, as we carry out the things that we're doing? Learn from me. Like, are we creating something in the church here and in America? Are we creating something that feels like Jesus saying, take my yoke upon you, and you're going to find rest for your souls? Y'all, this, this is so important. You know, next week... We have Palm Sunday, right? And you know, Palm Sunday, we think of this. Jesus coming into Jerusalem, gentle and mounted on a donkey, right? Now, if you know anything about kings and conquering, you say, what's up with that? Because the ride if you will, of a king is not a donkey, it's a war horse, or better yet, it's a tank, or better yet, it's a, you know, a, a, a fighter jet. But God's kings came on a donkey because it was this picture. It, it was a picture that God gave us to continually force us to remember that salvation and all the promises that we are believing God for, that inheritance comes in this upside down way that we're really not gonna get the kingdom without the king whose name is Jesus. And we're really not gonna get the kingdom no matter how much we push and fight and scream and holler and, and, and do what we gotta do or what our world says we have to do. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. And what do you do with this? You know, I think about Jesus' meekness before others and before God. As you try to develop a heart Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus is pretty fascinating when he just kept saying, I don't do anything 
unless the Father tells me to do it. God, I believe you for it. That Jesus says, I don't say anything unless the Father says to say, God, God, I believe you for it. And, and, and maybe, you know, just developing that kind of heart is to continue to say, God, I, I, I'm not the God of my life. And when life is not working out to whatever my fairy tale ending is, God, I'm going to keep saying, I believe you for it and however you're working this thing out. The second thing, meekness toward others. In a world where our cultural value is fight. I want to say something here, church, about, do y'all know that there's an election coming up, I think, in November? President of the United States, you guys might be aware. I want to say something about it now, because here's the deal. You know, in October, your brains are going to be so scrambled. Um, it, it, you're going to be so out of whack emotionally. If I try to get up and, and say, hey, guys, let's calm down, um, you know, you're going to think I have some kind of agenda, right? And um, everybody's going to say, what was Neil saying today? And I know this because I did that one time when everybody's freaking out after an election at one point. So I want to say something today while you are in half of your right mind, maybe. Um, just, this, just a thought here about meekness toward others. In a culture that says our number one value is to fight, there's a commentary that I've been using and studying on this Sermon on the Mount, these Beatitudes, written by a guy named Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Some of you have heard that name. I read something about this particular beatitude the other day that totally took me off guard, and I had to go back and say, wait, when did he write this? He wrote his commentary, the copyright is 1959, okay? 1959. So I just, I want to read this as you think about kind of our fightings and how we all kind of have to choose some big, he uses the word organization, maybe um, the Democrats or the Republicans or whatever your group is. Here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote about blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth in 1959. This beatitude comes, alas, in the form of a very striking contrast to much thinking within the Christian church at the present time. For is there not a rather pathetic tendency to think in terms of fighting the world and the things that are opposed to Christ by means of great organizations? 1959. Am I wrong when I suggest that the controlling and prevailing thought of the Christian church throughout the world seems to be the very opposite of what is indicated in Jesus' words, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. There, they say, is the powerful enemy set against us, and here is the divided Christian church. We must all get together. We must have one huge organization to face that organized enemy. Then we shall make an impact, and then we shall conquer. But blessed are the meek, not those who trust to their own organizing, not those who trust to their own powers and abilities and their own institutions. Rather, it is the very reverse of that. And this is true not only here, but in the whole message of the Bible. Church, I want you to know, I'm really praying for us that somehow the values of Jesus' church get deeply, deeply wrestled with in our hearts during these days. So we're going to close with a video. And um, the guy on the video is a guy named Brant. I've met Brant several times. He works with Tom at Howdy Ho Made. Y'all, you know, some of you may be saying, Neil, what do I do about this? Especially if I'm a powerful and influencer. <sighs> Guys, you know, maybe if you really have to have something to do today, maybe you do this. Maybe you just spend some time with those who the world says are unimportant 
or don't have influence. Not to pity them. Not to pity them at all, but to look and say, oh, blessed are the meek, for they don't inherit the earth. I, I want to learn from their heart, just like Jesus said, learn from my heart. So you, you go to, so today, here's what you can do. You can go to Howdy Homemade. Now, Tom, I hope this is not bad for business, but I got to say this, okay? Listen, if, you, if Brant serves you, I'm going to tell you, he's going to give you about three times as much ice cream as the normal order calls for. So just order a small, Tom, I'm sorry, and then you can give a big tip, okay? Let's watch this video. The importance of how it means to me, he really does everything, like skipping ice cream, making money, and have my face in grocery stores, like Tom Thumb, Albertsons, Windows, AJPs, and Publix. And um, I love how you remain a whole bunch. It, it, it makes me feel like I'm special, but not all the way special because of Jesus, the one only savior in the whole world is with me and everywhere I go. And, and, and sometimes when I go back to reality, 